Good evening, and once again, welcome to the Shadow Gallery. I am, as always, your host, James Donnelly. And you'll have to forgive the kind of lack of enthusiasm that I might otherwise have for this week's edition of New Comics, bitches! And it's not this week because I'm sick uh, or, you know, some of the usual uh, things that happen. Uh, but, of course, the, uh, you know, the kind of logic-defying head exploding uh, tragedy that occurred today in Boston at the Marathon um, it's really hard to kind of wrap my head around that. I had to actually left work early because it just, I just kind of wanted to be home with my wife, um, and to be around family at a time like this. Because, I mean, when you're dealing with something like that, I mean, that was literally, I, I walked into the office today and that was the first thing that I saw was, because they, they have a TV in the break room, in one of the break rooms, and it's CNN and ESPN and and CBS that, they, that these channels are tuned into, and they're all talking about what had just happened not too long before when I walked in the office. So that kind of helped to frame my day. So anyway, to those of you who might be watching uh, in or around the Boston area, I hope that you're all safe. Uh, my thoughts and, and lots of love go out to you. Uh, it's it's hard for me to really say anything about that, but other than just how horrible it is. But you know, I, if you follow me on Twitter, uh, I have retweeted I think several times, or if you follow me on Facebook, what have you. I have retweeted or posted several times a link to uh, Patton Oswalt's uh, you know, undeniably and very typically brilliant uh, kind of uh, treatise that he wrote on uh, this tragedy that occurred today. Uh, and it just, it really help to put things in perspective, you know, but I mean, that's, that's part of the power of Patton because he is a brilliant man and, you know, when it comes right down to it, a very compassionate man. So I've got my, got my American duds on here tonight, not just because of the comic books, but because I'm feeling kind of extra American tonight. Uh, you know, that we're all, you know, no matter what, we're still all one country. Anyway. So, <laughs> uh, moving along. So I just, you know, there's still part of me that's still kind of reeling from all of that. So it's hard for me to get into, you know, funny books tonight. But I will do my best. And I will let you know that, not just because of this, but because of just a little experiment that I kind of wanted to try. Well, okay, it is mostly because of that. That I decided to actually break this week's segment up into three parts over three nights. The reason being is that there are a lot of books to cover. So I'm going to go with a night for Marvel, which will be tonight a night for the independence, which will be tomorrow night, and then on Wednesday night will be a night for DC. And believe me when I say there is a pick of the week in every segment. So uh, each, each publisher put out something pretty extraordinary this week. So, um, although, okay, Admittedly, also, part of this is due to the fact that I didn't have kind of the normal time to get into review mode as I normally would have because I was also watching tonight on PBS 
they had their uh, uh, the 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 Wonder Women documentary, uh, which is about uh, basically female kind of superheroines in popular culture, specifically, you know, mostly about Wonder Woman, but about the kinds of characters that Wonder Woman helped to spawn in popular culture, you know, characters like Xena or Buffy or, you know, Charlie's Angels, you know, what have you, Bionic Woman, characters like that, that really kind of, you know, not only were, you know, that began long time ago, and still inspire people to this day, but also kind of suspicious, you know, kind of especially around the Wonder Woman TV show and how that kind of exploded into the zeitgeist of the era of the feminist movement and how it helped to create these characters that really did feel like, okay, well, they're, you know, the, this is important to women. It's, it's actually empowering for them uh, and into the present day. And they talked to a lot of people, of course, Gloria Steinem, uh, you know, a lot of uh, feminist authors, filmmakers, uh, you know, uh, feminist rockers. Uh, Gail Simone, of course, was uh, being interviewed for this. And it's just a really, really well done uh, documentary. And it really does beg the fucking question again, why, why, why in the fuck back in 2006 or 2007 did... Joel Silver put the kibosh on Joss Whedon writing and directing a Wonder Woman feature film. Why? Why did that happen? It's still, I mean, to this day, it still makes no fucking sense at all why that's something that they couldn't make happen. I mean, Joss Whedon, Wonder Woman, I mean, it really does seem like kind of a match made in heaven. You know, I mean, as far as someone who obviously brings very strong female characters to the table and you know that's kind of his it's kind of his modus operandi for almost all of his uh work um you know with maybe the exception of uh firefly and the avengers but there are still incredibly powerful women in those show you know in those shows or in uh in the avengers i mean you know black widow is given obviously a lot more screen time than she would have been Honestly, I believe if anybody else had directed that film, uh, Black Widow would have been relegated to a much smaller role. Uh, but uh, she wasn't, thankfully. Uh, so, but it was just—it was a really smart, really, really well done documentary. There were a couple of points I thought they were a little off base on uh, some of the people that were talking about it, um, but uh, you know. Uh, in regards to kind of the, you know, kind of the traditionally female sacrifice role in uh, popular culture, you know, particularly in comics, and that it always seems to be the woman that takes the hit and not the guy. And, and I, you know, I appreciated that on a number of different levels. Thankfully, they did kind of touch upon, at least uh, visually, they touched upon the women in refrigerators uh, controversy, but didn't actually speak about it. Um, but at least it was there to kind of witness. And there were some, you know, moments that I thought were a little bit, you know, it's like, I think you're a little bit off base there, but again, for the most part, in absolute and total agreement with, uh, with what, uh, pretty much all of these women had to say. Um, and, you know, it, it does make you kind of yearn, particularly when they were showing clips from uh, Terminator 2 and Aliens, where you're kind of watching the, the good old James Cameron at work there and how kind of his, uh, you know, early on in his career, it seemed to be kind of about, uh, you know, having uh, powerful female characters. And now that really just doesn't seem to be the case at all. Um, you know, it's very much a male-dominated uh, film catalog that he's done over the last however many films that he's done, because there aren't many. But they always have strong female characters, but they have not been the lead, if you will. So anyway, 
it was just really smart and if you didn't see it i'm sure it'll be on again and for those of you across the pond uh, who are not able to watch it i'm sure it will be on at some point for you guys to watch or maybe it'll be streaming online or something like that i hope so so but anyway let's actually get into tonight's comics uh and like i said for this edition we'll be discussing just marvel okay so uh some uh, some disappointments, a new title that I picked up based on some recommendations from my contest. Remember, if you do remember the contest, uh, it is basically, uh, you know, those of you who recommend a, uh, a comic that you think that I will enjoy, I will uh, give it a read if I can find it, and I will, you know, whichever title seems to kind of capture uh, the most imagination uh, capture me the best, I should say, uh, will be the one that I will eventually read. And that person who recommended it will get a prize. And it will be cool. So, let's move on. And we'll talk about that title tonight as we go along. So, first off is Fearless Defenders number three. Now, this was, you know, again, just kind of in line with what we were just talking about as far as, uh, you know, female... Uh, you know, her you know, heroines, female heroes, fuck it, just call them heroes, in popular culture. Uh, and this is, you know, kind of like the flagship title right now for what is supposed to be, you know, it's an all-female super team, and unfortunately it's kind of not good this week. <laughs> Um, because basically we have, uh, we have Misty, we have Valkyrie, uh, and we have Annabelle, uh, who uh, are basically are introduced to Warrior Woman uh, by uh, Hela, uh, who has brought Warrior Woman and Amazon. It's, it's basically it's Hippolyta. It is indeed Hippolyta. She is the you know uh, she's the daughter of Ares, um, and you know so she is a Greek goddess. And yes, you know I just, I just find it fun that they call her warrior woman and that she is in fact Hippolyta, you know, the queen of the Amazons. Although not, you know, uh, has, I don't know if she, I don't really recall if she has that kind of specific title, but she's somebody who is definitely made, you know, cut from kind of the, the cloth of Diana and uh, but is definitely kind of lacking in the compassion department um, that you would expect from Diana, from Wonder Woman. So basically, uh, these four have decided that it is, you know, well, okay, well, you know, Valkyrie and Misty and uh, Warrior Woman are definitely, well, okay, I shouldn't say all definitely, but are, are definitely Warrior Woman is on board to take down the Doom Maidens that, you know, is ultimately Valkyrie's responsibility for her to take care of. This is something that she should have done being a shield maiden. She should have found, you know, women that could have, you know, you know, you know, you know, uh, Super, you know, female superheroes that could have been able to take up uh, the uh, the title of being a shield maiden, and of course, you know, she couldn't find anybody uh, because she was she just didn't feel anybody was worthy enough. And then reluctantly, of course, Misty, and especially reluctantly, but also kind of flattered at the same time, is Annabelle. Um, but we have also the machinations of. Caroline Le Fay, who is doing something to Moonstar, uh, and she has, you know, it's Danny Moonstar, and she, uh, I'm not entirely sure what it is, but whatever it is, is supposed to wake up the Doom Maidens and bring them into the world. Um, and then we have, you know, just this kind of, you know, where we finally get to see Warrior Woman kind of cut loose and really show what she's made of. And then, of course, the Doom Maidens end up kind of turning the table on everybody, and it seems to not be working out well for anybody uh, by the end of the issue. So, 
to me, this issue was just save for some uh, so some really good character moments, which unfortunately there weren't many of, but just you know, kind of the uh, you would almost hate to use this word with associated with female heroes, but kind of some dick waving uh, between um, between Warrior Woman and Valkyrie. And Misty does have a great line about that. Um, Annabelle seems really, who is the only, well, I shouldn't say not the only new character here. Warrior Woman is definitely new. Uh, but, you know, to be kind of the only normal character here, she seems to kind of get relegated to the background while all the super-powered uh, ladies are, are kicking, are, you know, trying to kick some ass. Um, I'm not sure what the end game is here for this Caroline Le Fay character. Um, and this book just seems to really be kind of spinning its wheels. Like, it's just... It's, it just seems to be kind of stuck in neutral right now, which is, it's way, way, way too early for a book like this to be, to have an issue like this. I don't know, it's weird though, because I guess because you get, you, you know what you like, okay? You, everybody who reads comics has their own specific tastes. And um, I think that because we've been spoiled to some really brilliant uh, comics creators over the years, I've never really been a fan of Cullen Bunn, so I can kind of understand to me where where that comes from, but I was enjoying uh, this series, and I still am, I'm still on board, but again, this just, I guess, I just, wa I, I need it to be more. I need there to be something more to this book. So, uh, you know, the art by Will Sliney, it, it's okay. You know, I mean, he, he gives decent definition. None of the art is really cheesecakey, which is really nice for a book that is, you know, essentially, you know, populated by female characters. So I mean, none of it seems exploitative or hypersexual or, you know, hypersexualized or anything like that. And that's a really smart thing to do with a book like this. But at, by the same token, the definition of uh, the characters are a little bit off. Um, I would like there to be something more artistically. Uh, it's just not very dynamic. Um, but again, it's just, you know, I think... Again, because we've been spoiled by some, you know, some recent uh, new titles that really seem to kind of, you know, just start to, you know, take off almost immediately and never really look back, to have a book that this early on, its third issue, is kind of like stuck in neutral, it's it's hard to to think that this will have a continued audience, which I think... Uh, unfortunately will really hurt the book sales wise and will eventually show somebody you know at Marvel saying well you know females I guess don't really sell titles as much as we want them to it's still a guy's world so you know and that's it's just unfortunate I th and I just wish that if there was a better I just I, I know that there's a better creative team for this idea out there I know that we're gonna have our all-female X-Men uh, book coming out that's going to be by Brian Wood. I can't remember who's going to be doing art on that, but you know, it, I know that Brian Wood at least he's a guy that I like. So, um, and and a lot of other people like. So I think that uh, people will get behind this stuff again. I know that Colin Bunn, you know, he does the Sixth Gun, which is a book that I don't read, but uh, you know, I know it's becoming a TV show for NBC. Uh, but to me, it's just like. All of his stuff with Marvel has been kind of just very meh at best. So, it's a two and a half out of five for uh, Fearless Defenders number three. Uh, Secret Avengers number three. Um, basically, we have uh, we have AIM, you know, and their country of Gallia uh, trying to really enforce their. Uh, 
diplomatic status that they are recognized by the UN and they have the right to go where they want to go. And what's going on here is that, uh, you know, S.H.I.E.L.D. Director Daisy Johnson and Marcus Johnson, a.k.a. Nick Fury, are going to basically a uh, defense technologies expo in which they're hoping to basically have get some of this fun stuff. And then there is a guy who is kind of sort of in charge of the oversight for S.H.I.E.L.D. in a way. You know, he does help them get funding and, you know, just make sure they have all the cool toys and everything like that. And um, they, for whatever reason, the Iron Patriot armor is on display. Now, this is, of course, this rings kind of the death knell for this whole uh, thing because of what it symbolizes. Because the last person to wear this armor was Norman fucking Osborn, and he's a fucking lunatic. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just... You know, the, the symbolism of it is just frightening. And, of course, here comes AIM with their, you know, with their head guy, and they are immediately met through hostility. And they've also brought with Yelena, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the opposite number of, uh, Natasha Romanoff's, uh, Black Widow. And who seems to have shape-shifting powers, which I didn't know she had, but okay. Anyway, um... In the meantime, there is another mission that the kind of core uh, hero, the you know the superhero uh, team, which is made up now of uh, you know of Clint, you know of Hawkeye and Black Widow and Mockingbird, and you know kind of and Phil Coulson also kind of running this is that AIM has a facility that there that has been destroyed whether they cause it themselves or whatever, they go to basically assault it and take kind of stock of what happened there. And that's where they find what kind of happened with, you know, what we saw in the, in, uh, I want to say that this, I believe it happened in the first issue where you have the, the, the new AIM director, uh, you know, basically, you know, that these AIM scientists, you know, once they've completed whatever that, you know, they feel this to be, to be their best work, they just kill themselves. So that's a little bit off-putting to uh, everybody involved here. Uh, but they do recover something that seems to be left over, or is uh, that, and it's a, it's a Jocasta head. And the Jocasta head seems to recognize Phil Coulson, which is interesting. Uh, but... Uh, aim when they you know are met with the consequences of their actions they say well act, you know we acted completely in self-defense which honestly to be fair to them they kind of did which is striking to say the least because they did not actually make the first offensive move it was uh, it was quake and Nick Fury that first started the shooting or started all the ruckus uh, so, uh, does not look uh, too great for for them, and everything for AIM is certainly coming up roses. But the uh, really the implication here that's being made in this scene uh, near the end, which uh, the, the 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 AIM leader is talking to uh, someone from the UN, what have you, and you know trying to kind of clean up this diplomatic mess. You know, they asked, did you abscond with any tech that was present? And they say, no, that they didn't. And uh, here enters, uh, we have Mentallo, who comes into the scheme of things here. And he kind of gets his, you know, his part in what, you know, Begalia has to play is that, yes, they did indeed leave with the Iron Patriot armor. And Mentallo they're looking to kind of plug him into that so that he can control, either control people mentally or just control the actual, you know, armor itself. So, I mean, we've got, you know, so that's what this is shaping up into. So, you know, Nick Spencer, Luke Ross, uh, 
doing some really nice work here. It, it's, however, um, this particular issue does lack some punch. Uh, it, it doesn't feel like, it, it felt like, again, there was more story to tell, but they just didn't get around to it. So, and that, that happens, you know, I get it. Uh, I still don't think it should cost $3.99. I know that I get all of the Marvel stuff for free, uh, but there are still some uh, ones that I do buy because, you know, that's just what you do to support things. I usually, uh, you know, if I can buy the physical copies, then I will. If I can't, then I'll just buy it digitally. So that at least I've given the money to keep supporting the Marvel book of choice. So, um, but this, you know, this was still, it was a good issue, not a great issue. It's a three and a half out of five. I, I mean, I, you know, Spencer has, again, some really lovely character moments, some really good dialogue. Luke Ross is kind of very shadowy work, works very well for a title like this because it is, you know, the undercover guys. So, um, and I just, I really enjoy how the fact that Phil Coulson, the voice of Phil Coulson has really become kind of the voice of Clark Gregg's interpretation of Phil Coulson. So bringing him from the screen into the comic book universe is great, but to also have him be kind of the Clark Gregg kind of voice coming out, I mean, you really hear it. It's very distinct, uh, the way that Spencer writes it. So I think, you know, good for them. It's a, it's a, good, it's a good direction to go in. But again, three and a half out of five for Secret Avengers number three. Avengers number nine. Uh, so basically we have here, we have Nightmask and Starbrand. They have gone back to Mars, despite kind of some recommendations against doing that, to kind of see the place of their birth. And of course, as with the end of the last issue, they meet up with Ex Nihilo. And Ex Nihilo kind of describes some of his, you know, even though that he's exiled on Mars, he still has plans for Earth. And those plans are still on Earth in the seeds that he's planted in the kind of garden of Earth that, that he refers to it as. And these all kind of these different kind of experimentations that he's done and so on and so forth are pretty pretty bizarre and but they all have a purpose. Uh, which I think is very interesting that uh, that Hickman did include in this. And they, you know, and Starbrand and Nightmask do pop down to Earth to uh, one of the quarantine sites that's in Croatia, which is this beach where all these really kind of almost these kind of creepy looking things are there just kind of on the beach. And they start to come to life. And you know, the Avengers kind of immediately scramble and teleport to the location. And what they witness, of course, is again, Starbrand, who has no idea of his power. He has no idea how to control it. He has no idea what to do with it. He just blasts this thing that, you know, this, you know, that, that just, just gains sentience is just, and has, you know, become this huge blob of whatever. And it starts grabbing Nightmask and trying to pull him in and he just destroys it completely and almost, you know, and maybe destroys some of the air, the surrounding area. So this really comes to the point where the Avengers have to make the decision. Okay. Are, you know, is, you know, our star brand and night mask, particularly star brand, are they just too dangerous to let run to kind of let come and go as they please? And this is, of course, where we have the kind of epic, non-epic fight. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, there's a, the thing about this issue to me is that this whole fight scene that takes place at the end, which is, you know, where Starbrand and Nightmask are fighting the Avengers, you know, the, the totality of the Avengers... And they've got, you know, and it's mostly drawn by Mike Diodato Jr., who, great to see him again, 
And I'm hoping that, you know, as much as I've actually, I actually enjoy Dustin Weaver's art, I'm hoping that Diodato kind of takes over from here. But he does, like, the epic stuff. He does the really big splash pages and everything like that. And he does them beautifully. The art is just fantastic. But it feels very folded in. Like, it was like a last-minute decision for Hickman to say, okay, you know what? This has got to, we've got to wrap this up because we've got stuff coming up for the next arc. So we really got to tack on this final fight scene. And it is it does feel really tacked on. Like there was too much story to tell in this small issue. So they decided to just kind of like, here's the big fight. Here's the resolution. Boom. We're done. We're done. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's it's sad um, because this is something that should have. Again, we are seeing kind of the cold Hickman at work here. This this is a very odd book. It's a very odd book because you get kind of you get the the warm emotional Hickman you see in some issues, and you get kind of the cold sciency or just kind of flat Hickman in other issues. And it's been kind of like that almost throughout the entire series so far. I mean, the the first arc started off much stronger. I mean, having you know Jerome Pena do the art obviously didn't hurt. Um, Dustin Weaver is not a bad artist by any stretch of the imagination. And you know, issue five was one of my picks of the week. Uh, it was a great issue. It was the best issue of this book so far. And just to see this kind of tacked on ending just seems like a cheat is really it, it just it just seems like he just kind of uh he just took a lot of shortcuts just to get it to end and you know he even harkens back to technology that exists in new avengers his other title uh but if you don't read that you're not really understanding what's going on where starbrand and nightmask end up in at the end of the story so it's a little bit like hmm but you know whether or not again this is kind of the bringing in the, of the the you know the ideas of the new universe into marvel 616 i don't know if it's this is just the beginning of that if he's going to continue doing this i don't know but i'm just hoping that the next arc is better than this one because this one just was very lackluster I mean, aside, I mean, aside from the art, which I do have to give some major props to, because Weaver and Diodato do some very, 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 very good work. Um, the the writing, unfortunately, does not match it. So it's a three out of five, really, for Avengers number nine, uh, and it's kind of a flimsy three out of five at that. Now going on to some more Avengers, uh, we have Uncanny Avengers number six. Um, basically, we are back in kind of the Dark Ages. We're in like 10 whatever, 60 whatever, I, I didn't write down the year. And uh, basically, Apocalypse, or and Nabasur, or whatever he wants to be called right now, uh, is in league with Rama Tut, a.k.a. Immortus, a.k.a. King the Conqueror. And they're in bed together. I mean, not literally. <laughs> that would just be weird. Um, but they have partnered up, and because Kang, a.k.a. Rama Tut, a.k.a. whatever, you know, he knows that in the future that there is a particular uh, Avenger that will spoil his plans for you know, the conquering of the world, whatever. And uh, so he sends in, you know, he basically, he kind of instigates, you know, Apocalypse instigates this battle with Thor. And it is really, and this is Thor of that age, so he does not have Mjolnir yet. He has a giant axe. 
and he's not afraid to use it. Um, now it's again this is more of the Thor, you know, the war making Thor, the man who, you know, the the Thor who uses you know, not a hammer that can both be wielded as a weapon and as a uh, you know, as a as a tool, but he has a big old axe. And he's not a f I don't even ask me to pronounce what it's what it's called because you know until I actually heard Mjolnir said I think in the Thor film I had no idea how to pronounce it so but anyway so we have this kind of you know this epic fight between Thor and Apocalypse where Thor does kind of tuck tail and run because he realizes that he's beat but he's not running per se is making kind of a strategic retreat so that he can regroup and then fight Apocalypse another day and really defeat him. And thanks to a cleverly disguised Kang in the body of Loki, uh, he is he does uh, get an, a special enchantment for his axe that will actually help him to defeat Apocalypse. And even though he's been kind of strictly forbidden from engaging in combat with Apocalypse, that Apocalypse will just leave and, you know, this will be, you know, because Odin has basically told him, no, don't do this, because this will be visited upon us tenfold in the future. So don't, basically just leave it be. But we know Thor, especially from this age, he hasn't learned how to be a hero yet, really he's still just kind of in it for the glory. So, but again, we come back to this idea of the Avenger, you know, this, uh, you know, this uh, uh, ancestor of this Avenger whose last name is Logan. And that will eventually, you know, harm Apocalypse and, and stop his plans. And so we have now. I'm I'm assuming this somehow ties into Uncanny X Force when Remender was writing that. But what we have here is you know this battle uh, that comes to London in again in this era in the ten you know in the eleventh century. And uh, you know and Apocalypse you know. Thwarted again, you know, Thor comes a following and he's ready to, you know, he's brought his, at that time, his four horsemen of the apocalypse with him. Thor defeats them all. And Apocalypse basically says, you know what, I'm just going to lay waste to London. Fuck it. I'm just going to, you know, I'm not going to try and single out, you know, this person or that person. I'm just going to destroy it all. I'm just going to burn it all. And of course, Thor puts a stop to that and using a special enchanted axe, he actually cleaves through Apocalypse's armor and gives him a really nasty wound. Of course, it doesn't kill him, but and that which does not kill you makes you stronger. And so he is then, you know, he gets his ass out of there, goes back to Kang and basically says, look, you guys, you know, you, you're kind of, you're kind of messing my shit up here and and Kang is basically, he's, you know, kind of, he doesn't really want to deal with Apocalypse because he has plans, which is why he told Thor about the enchantment that he could put on his axe. His axe was eventually, uh, is kind of stripped from him by, o from, from Thor by Odin, who again warns him that, you know, this was just a really stupid thing to do. And... Then we get to the present, and we see Kang in the present at the grave of Baron Mordo. And, uh, well, the, and Baron Mordo's, uh, you know, his corpse, his body, whatever, is holding the axe. And this is why Kang, this, this whole Mac. This whole the whole machination of Kang because he can jump throughout time is very very interesting, and the way that it's used. Uh, so whatever purpose that he had back for this a thousand years ago 
is going to come to light in the present day with the quote unquote, you know, with these apocalypse twins, whatever they're going to be, which is something that we haven't really found out yet. Now, we have on art here, we have Dan, Daniel Acuna, who is, of course, an awesome artist. The, and the art in this is just fantastic. But there were two problems that I had with this book. First of all, because the last issue ended on, you know, issue five ended on such a big moment, it seems like that would be the kind of thing that you would want to immediately revisit because you've got momentum building up there. And it was a really, really good issue. Uh, kind of sadly, almost better than anything that uh, they had John Cassidy on art for, I think largely because you know, Cassidy is an artist that likes to take his time and really, really make very, very, very beautiful art. Uh, I know that some of you, and you know who you are, consider him overrated. I do not. I think that he's brilliant. But, you know, I think that Cassidy, he's just not the kind of guy that can really work with deadlines unless he has his stuff prepared months in advance so which is why you know last issue i think it was one of the cuberts i believe that was on art and this issue we have daniel Acuna, who i do hope stays but i'm sure probably won't uh because this is going to be another one of those revolving door artist titles uh, even though remender i'm sure will stay on it for as long as he wants because that's just the way it works um, because Remender is enough of kind of a star over at Marvel to do whatever he wants. So that was a big problem for me, uh, that it didn't build on the ending of the previous issue, which was really strong and really captivating. It was a really terrific issue. And then, uh, you know, I, I like what goes on in this issue. It's really interesting. It's really, it's fascinating, really, to see kind of this different time but again, the other big problem is that it's not really an Avengers title. You know, there's just, there's Thor and there's some talky talk from an ancestor of Wolverines. So it's like, okay, I kind of see how it ties in there, but not really because, you know, it's just the only one we really see in action here is Thor. Uh, so it really felt like this was kind of a, I mean, I know it was kind of a one-off, but it really seems like they just made kind of a weird decision to put this, to kind of smack this one in the middle. It's like really this issue in number five should have traded places because the momentum that Remender was building off of in the last issue is really kind of just kind of screeched to a halt here. So, but again, this is still a really good book. And, you know, I would, rec I would recommend it really highly. So it's just that, but I do have to grade it based on the fact that it is part of a series and not just a standalone issue. Uh, so I, I give it a four out of five, a very solid four out of five. And, you know, it's, it's, it's very well told, really well written, beautifully done art. So just, you know, it's definitely worth a look. Um, on to more Avengers, sort of. Uh, and that is Ultimate, number 23. Now, this is the kind of penultimate issue for Sam Humphreys, who after, you know, with issue 25 is when I believe that Josh Fialkoff is going to be taking over. Yay! I just get so excited when I say his name, because it's like, I know that this is going to be going somewhere cool now. Because, unfortunately, this issue, and kind of the run of Sam Humphreys in general, not so great. Um... You know, basically, we get some backstory here on the, you know, the West Coast Ultimates and how they've, uh, you know, how Nick Fury approached them all when they all started off and, you know, asked them to, you know, you know, to kind of post 9-11, you know, to hunt for Osama bin Laden and, you know, how they all kind of were caged after that, you know, Wonder Man and Black Knight and Tigra and the Vision um, and Quake. Uh, so, you know, you get this, uh, you know, they've all been released by this, this, uh, strange, you know, this, the, the spokesperson for California, Mr. Ford, 
who is behind all of this, and he has a grand scheme here. And basically, you know, the West Coast Ultimates, they basically take the fight to President Cap. And uh, we have uh, this, um, you know, this battle kind of literally on the White House lawn, but, if, you know, with Quake and Tigra, there's all a distraction for Vision to go into space and kind of jack this uh, uh, this satellite that Tony Stark is just on that Stark Industries is just unveiled that is going to again it's going to be one of those kind of beacons of self sufficient you know self sustaining energy that type of thing and uh, you know and uh, but it's it's basically being hijacked and the the West Coast of you know the West Coast Ultimates have basically been told a big fat lie by this Mr. Ford that, you know, Cap is, you know, he stole the election um, and that this satellite, this J-Raid satellite that's that's in orbit that Tony Stark put up there is actually a weapon and not something that's designed for energy conversion and, you know, using the, you know, microwave energy in space to create, you know, energy, you know, to create basically free energy for the world parts of the world, whatever, and uh, it's just, you know, and so Vision has essentially hijacked it, and he's aiming it at Sacramento. He basically wants it to crash there so that it will look like this was something that was planned indeed by President Cap, and is looking to unify the West Coast against the rest of the United States, embroiling them in perhaps another civil war. And that seems to be kind of the end game here. Now, that seems, and then, but of course, you know, we also have Thor and Sue Storm, who are on the moon right now, who are chasing the Infinity Gem, and they get kind of smacked around uh, for one, you know, for two whole frames by Black Knight, uh, who seems to kind of come literally out of nowhere. And seems to be more powerful than Thor and Sue Storm. And I'm and that's just kind of where it leaves off. It's like, what the fuck? <laughs> Why introduce this if you're not going to go anywhere with it unless there's just one of those things they're saving up for the next issue. Um, this this issue is just it, it's just so kind of it's just so much of a mishmash of ideas here that it is so incredibly unclear as to what the hell Humphreys is trying to do right now. I have no clue what he wants to do with this series, where he wants to go with this arc. It doesn't make any sense at this point in time. I am completely fucking lost. It's like, what is his end game? Is he, you know, I get what, you know, what Mr. Ford is trying to do, sort of, but, you know, it's like, I don't know what, I mean, I feel like that the that what the end game of this storyline will eventually be is that either a that the West Coast Ultimates are going to get put back into confinement or b they're going to understand you know that yes they were all taken advantage of and they need to and you know they need to become the you know part of the the Ultimates team and so that we may get some new characters there Although it definitely seems like the vision, you know, definitely seems like Vision and Black Knight are kind of in this for themselves. But Tigra and Quake have definitely been fed a line of bullshit, and they, and they are starting to realize that. Um, so you know, we have some good fight scenes, and it's you know, it's okay. But I mean, again, just the whole narrative of this book seems incredibly disjointed. So. This was at best a two and a half out of five. And one of the other things that I had a really big problem with, or I'm starting to have a really big problem with, is that this is starting to feel more and more like a traditional comic book, a traditional superhero comic book, as opposed to the work that was brought to us by, you know, like Millar and Hitch and Hickman where it was decidedly kind of more, not mature, but just a little bit more, well, I shouldn't say not adult, but just a little bit more mature. There were more, you know, there were more themes that were going on just other than fight, 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 fight. Um, 
so I miss that. I miss that feeling, that uh, that general feeling of this being smarter than the average bear kind of book. I mean, because the Ultimates, I mean, let's face it, that was the best book. I mean, at least while Millar and Hitch were doing it, it was the best book of, I believe, of the Ultimate line. Uh, you know, I mean, I have respect for what Bendis and Bagley were doing on Ultimate Spider-Man. There were there were some issues. There were some uh, story arcs. There were some issues of Ultimate X Men that were awesome. But I mean, just insane props to uh, uh, to Millar and Hitch for the work that they did because they really topped it out. I mean, that was just epic stuff. So I just I really missed that vibe that uh, those those books brought. So Alpha Big Time Number Four. Speaking of Josh Fialkoff. So basically we have here, Andy is still kind of reeling from this kind of surprise, uh, you know, would-be villain, perhaps, uh, that, kind of, you know, the mugger that he assaulted in the first issue and just kind of wakes up and grabs him. It's like, ah! Um, and so we're still kind of, you know, in shock from, from that. And, but it turns out to be kind of nothing, at least first. Uh, and so, you know, Andy does his thing where he's just kind of, he's starting to feel very disillusioned once again with kind of doing the whole superhero thing. He just, he seems to kind of want to go back to being kind of a normal kid. And here comes Octo Spidey, who is, you know, puts him through some more tests and, you know, gives him some more stuff to do and so on and so forth, but not so much to really think about. He's just not really there as a mentor like Peter Parker might have been. But what we have here really is, um, you know, Andy kind of becoming increasingly disillusioned with the way that everything seems to be working out for him, which is not good. And then all of a sudden he starts to sense our character of Soup Can, uh, who is in serious trouble. Uh, her the coffee shop that she works at is on fire, and he senses this, like they have some kind of connection. And he goes and you know puts out the fire, saves her, and of course she immediately recognizes him as being Andy, her classmate, uh, that he you know that he is very much crushing on. And he starts to talk about the connection that they have, and you know, he even calls her by her first name. It's like, you know, no, that you know, my name is Soup Can. Susan is my slave name. You know, I mean, it's just, it's again, it's those Fialkov kind of patented Fialkov moments that make it so worthwhile. Um, and uh, so when he kind of comes back to have some more tests done on him by uh, Octo Spidey. He starts to talk about his, apparently that he may have some kind of psychic ability that he was unaware of before, and so he decides to again, not with much encouragement from Octo Spidey, he tries to go and basically kind of figure it out for himself. In which he tries to really, he just really strains to tap into his own, you know, mental abilities. And then, boom, it's like the whole fucking city is, he can hear everybody's thoughts. And it's almost like one of those things that will drive you totally insane. But until he starts to focus on just one voice and he, he, and he sees Soup Can. And she's talking about how she kind of likes him. How she kind of likes Andy. Uh, and, of course, this is kind of like that Rudolph the Rendo's Reindeer thing where he starts going, she thinks I'm cute! You know, and he just starts flying all over the place. It's like, yes! And, but down below, we have kind of the waking up of this, uh, of the mugger. And he's not quite himself anymore. And we also have some other new villains that are coming onto the page here that seem to really, really have it in for Alpha for unknown reasons but reasons I'm sure that we're going to get into. 
but they definitely, you know, they talk about, you know, you know, you can't just kill this guy. The only way to really defeat a guy like this is to torture and kill the people that are closest to him and make him watch. And of course, all this while he's just, he's thinking to himself, everything is just, everything's coming up alpha. It's all going to be great from here on out. And yeah, so <sighs> Fialkov and uh, Nuno Plati are doing such a good job on a book that you would just not expect anybody to do a good job with, which is, I think, one of the reasons that they got Josh Fialkov to write this book, because he said, look at what this fucking guy did with I Vampire, with Andrew Bennett, you know, and made him really awesome and was telling this extremely compelling story issue after issue. And, you know, so, I mean, to, I mean, in a character that's totally marginalized, that nobody remembers except for like a select few. And, you know, it's kind of, but everybody thinks it's a great comic. Almost everybody who reads it thinks that iVampire is brilliant. But unfortunately, that number wasn't very high. So, um, so what we have here, I think, is just, they're taking a character that you're designed to hate kind of almost instantly that Dan Slott created and make you start to like him. And you do. That's the crazy thing is that you start to get where Andy McGuire is coming from because of how well these two tell this story. You know, these the introductions of these villains kind of seems to be a little bit out of nowhere, to be quite honest. And that would be kind of my only kind of nitpicky thing. Well, I mean, it's my only real issue with this issue, with number three. But, I mean... Wow, it's still such a, you know, it's, it's still a very entertaining, strong read. I mean, I I don't think that Nuno Plotti is going to be winning any artist awards anytime soon because his, his style is definitely very unusual. You would not expect him to be doing a book kind of like this. He, you think that he would be more at home, like kind of in a more independent setting. But uh, I, got, I got to hand it to him. I mean, he still does make this book look pretty. So... This was a very, very solid four out of five, almost edging towards four and a half. Because again, it's just another really, really good read, fun, entertaining, smart, kind of scary at some times. And just, you know, the way that Fialkov seems to be kind of laying out the framework for the way that this book is going to continue until it's done, I think, with its fifth issue. So, but for, yeah, so if. Uh, definite four out of five for Alpha Big Time number three. I think I did initially introduce it as number four, but no, it's number three. So on to kind of the Marvel picks of the week. This we're going to first talk about is the book that somebody did recommend that I pick up. And boy, this I'm glad that I was able to pick it up at kind of what seems to be what other people are saying is kind of a, a good jumping on point, and that is Thor, God of Thunder, number seven. So we have here Jason Aaron and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Asad Ribic on art. So it's like, okay, why was I not reading this before, really, type of thing. Um, and basically, uh, you know, what we have here is that we have the Thor... We have three Thors in this issue. We have the Thor of the past that uh, is embroiled in this battle with uh, this this new character of Gore, the God Butcher. And I mean, just that name alone has got to send some tingles down your spine, especially when you're reading a book about a god. Um, and kind of his fight with him, you know, kind of near the beginning of, you know, his, you know, kind of pre, again, kind of pre-hero Thor, certainly pre-Marvel Universe introduction Thor, um, where he's definitely a much hornier Thor, 
uh, because you know when we first see him, he's in bed with two chicks and he's a little bit worn out, uh, but he's still keeping watch for this this god, you know, this god butcher. And then we have the Thor of the present is meeting the Thor of the far flung future, who is now he looks like Odin. He's lost an eye. He's lost an arm, which he has actually put on a destroyer's arm. And all of the other gods are either dead or in enslaved. And this is Thor's future. And we have present Thor, who you know knows, of course, of the existence of this god butcher, and you know because he's obviously fought him before, but it's like plucked from three different timelines. So, you know, we have this Thor that's experiencing these things from his younger days where he is actually captured by Gore. And we have this Thor of the present era, which may or may not be the old Thor. Uh, and again, may not be the, the young Thor either. So it is really... Because we do, what is introduced here, well not introduced because this is something that I do believe that has previously existed, is the nexus of all the gods. Because you obviously have the nexus of all realities, um, but specifically here we have this world called the nexus of all the gods. Um, and that is indeed where the god butcher intends to strike. And we have Thor, old Thor and current Thor, um, getting ready to do battle, and of course, you know, there's a big, you know, you know, he's, you know, you know, old Thor talks about certain things that uh, Thor, you know, that present Thor might do or might end up becoming, and <laughs> it's just there's some really fun. I mean, this is Jason Aaron again, so I mean, there's some really funny stuff in this book, but there's some incredibly compelling storytelling going on here as well. Having Asad Ribic on art certainly doesn't hurt because he's awesome. Um, but it's a much darker look, though, than the, the Asad Ribic that I'm kind of used to from the Ultimates because his, you know, the, the coloring for that book seemed much brighter uh, than it does here. This is very dark stuff, but it's understandable why it's dark because we're dealing with Gore, the God Butcher. So, I mean, this is freaky shit and you know the older thor you know the the old thor the future thor tells you know present thor to go get ready for battle you know and there's this closed off hall and he believes that it's going to contain all of these weapons that he's going to use to get ready it's like i don't need any weapons and of course it's a hall filled with alcohol <laughs> it's just all mead and you know uh you know beer, you know, just all of the different names of uh, the different inebriates of the time. Uh, ale, casks of ale, you know, giant casks of ale. And it's like, yeah, I could use a drink. Uh, and they go off together in this huge, you know, spacefaring, you know, Viking boat to, you know, confront their fates and to laugh in the face of death. As they confront, you know, as they're on their way to confront uh, Gore. Now, unfortunately, the past Thor is witness to Gore's kind of opening salvo against the Nexus of all the gods, and it is, you know, your jaw is just like, <clears throat> holy fuck! This is now. Uh, I know that, and I don't remember who recommended this, this, re recommended this to me. I think it might have been Scott. Uh, if that was you, I'll have to go back and go go back to the, the uh, my previous video and look because you may kind of run away with this here. I haven't read for for. I don't remember who recommended uh, Mars Attacks to me. I haven't been able to get any issues of that yet, but I am getting on that. I think one comes out this week. Um, and uh, I know, Ben, you recommended to me Conan, the Barbarian, which I did actually read the last issue of and thought it was pretty darn good. 
Um, but I mean, I gotta tell you, whoever recommended this book to me is definitely the front runner <laughs> because this book was awesome. There is just some epic shit going on here. I mean, you know, Aaron Ribic, you know, just, they're, they're clearly having a good time with this character and helping to develop these worlds and everything like that. And these, you know, these, this past, this present, this future, um, they seem to be much more interested in the past and the future, uh, because, you know, we know what the present's kind of like. Um, but they're just doing really, really compelling storytelling here. I mean, this is a very, very strong issue of comics. And for those of you who aren't reading this, who like Jason Aaron and who like Esad Ribic, I think this is time for you to hop on board, try this issue out, because this is good, good stuff. Very solid four and a half out of five. Almost teetering, to, you know, kind of teetering towards five on this issue. It was just, it was awesome. But the pick of the week for Marvel, and might end up being the pick of the week. We'll talk more about this when we get through all of our comics by went by Wednesday night, and that is Hawkeye number nine. Hot guy. Basically, what we have here in this issue, it's <laughs> it's hard to laugh at this issue because of some of the things that go on in it. But there are some really funny moments because the book itself is just so fucking good. I mean, this is really you know Marvel. This is their best book right now by a pretty big margin. I mean, Marvel has some really good books out there, but this kind of blows all the rest of their shit out of the water because it's, you know, anyway. So we've got basically the ladies of Clint's life. Natasha, Bobby, Jessica, Kate all kind of play a very large role in this particular issue. And of course, the very mysterious and very uh, femme fatale Darlene that, uh, that was introduced back in issue four, issue five, whichever one they picked up the Challenger in, um, or the old Charger, that beautiful car that unfortunately did get swept away by Hurricane Sandy. Um, but... They are kind of all play separate roles in Clint's day, this particular day that, uh, in which she does come back and they're all there. Um, he's at Avengers Mansion and he's like, well, this looks bad, right? in my head, this looks bad because, you know, there's <laughs> Natasha and Bobby and Jessica all looking at him. Of course, Jessica is kind of supposed to be his current lady love. Uh, but you know, that's, that's Clint all over. He's kind of a, you know, he's, he's kind of like, he's kind of like second place to Daredevil for the guy that really gets around, you know what I mean? Um, but you know, we have here is, you know, these uh, these four kind of separate sections that not that some of them do and some of them don't intersect with one another but you know what we have here is first we deal with Natasha who wants to know exactly what the hell is going on with this strange woman what is her deal and of course the fact that he may have kind of inadvertently helped her to commit murder uh, back in, I think, issue six. Uh, yeah, I think so. And uh, when he helped her rob the uh, uh, the Russians, the, the tracksuit Draculas. Uh, and... Um, basically what is her deal and she kind of lays it on him the framework that was started in the last issue which is where we have um, them discussing the fact that they're going to kill Clint Barton 
you know, I mean, all of the, uh, you know, the, the, the various criminals that uh, have already been uh, fought in uh, in the run on uh, in the run of this book, Kingpin, Madame Mask, so on and so forth. They all basically decide that Clint Barton, it's time for him to die. And you know, if you're going to go after a superhero, you know, if you're going to go after an Avenger and kill them, who's the guy that you go after? You go after the normal Joe. You know the regular guy that's the guy you go after because everybody else has got superpowers or super spies or whatever and clint while obviously a very uh, talented man in his own right is not that guy he's not the uh you know he he's still you know he has to kind of rely on you know his smarts and his aim and you know you take that bow and arrow away from him and you know he can still definitely put a hurt on you but he's not going to be able to outshoot a whole bunch of mobsters um, and the first person that we end up dealing with well the next person that we end up dealing with is Bobby and of course this all happens to take place on Valentine's Day um, and, Clint, you know, and Clint comes to you know, he comes to the door to greet her, and you know he's he's only been asleep for like forty five minutes. He thinks it's the next day, um, and you know of course he's wearing his uh, kind of bullseye shirt uh, that I did buy for myself. By the way, there's a website, and I can't remember what the hell it's called right now. I could look in my email, but I don't feel like it. And it it does actually sell. It actually sells the cover. Well, not the cover, but just the logo that's on the cover of this uh, uh, of the T-shirt that I think it must be Kate that wears the, the I Love Hawkeye. Uh, but it does also sell this shirt. I'm like, I have to get this. <laughs> I need this shirt um, because I, I love this book so much. Um, it basically... All of these women, they kind of represent Clint's irresponsibility, particularly with women. Of course, you have Bobby who comes in. She is, of course, the ex-wife. Um, and she is there. And Clint's kind of looking out his window, and he's talking about how he's kind of had to tone it down recently because of his activity, uh, trying to kind of ward off the tracksuit Draculas from this building to, to kind of, you know, protect the people that he, you know, that are, that live in his building. And he, uh, and there's this van that is parked out there that is definitely a van. And of course, Bobby goes down to check it out. And there's, you know, the tracks of Dracula's there, bro. And they are bro, bro, broing a machine gun or machine pistol anyway. And she ends up knocking them around and everything like that and she just ends up wondering Clint what the hell have you gotten yourself into this time and then we have of course the visit from Kate who uh, is uh, is actually this uh, this visit be, uh, starts on its way when she's kind of riding to Clint's place on her purple Vespa and you know in her purple suit and everything like that and she, of course, also comes across the tracksuit Draculas and beats the shit out of them again. Well, the first time, anyway. Bro. And uh, she's on her way up to talk to Clint. And then here comes Jessica. And what is the first thing that she does? Right across the face. Because she believe that she and Clint were together and that they weren't just as Clint so wrongly puts it just having some laughs uh, that she was taking this a little bit more seriously and you know as Kate kind of comes in she's on her way out and basically saying you know his superpower is that Clint will always let you down. And this, of course, brings Clint to a very low point. And, you know, ultimately, we have Kate actually kind of actively trying to cheer him up by basically telling him that 
he's a shit boyfriend, but he's not a bad guy. You know, he's actually a good guy, but he's just a bad, bad boyfriend. Um, and he just kind of surrenders to the day and just saying, you know what, well, look, you, everybody just kind of do whatever. I'm going back to bed because that's it for me. And he goes upstairs, he goes to the rooftop where Grills is getting his grill on. And they have a little bit of a kind of a not heart to heart, but just a little bit of a conversation. And Gil and uh, Grills is talking to Hawkeye. You know, just you know, giving him some some homespun wisdom. And then Clint kind of goes back to his apartment. And then just, uh, you are destroyed in just a couple of frames from a man that seems to come from hell. It was, it just, it just takes this issue in an entirely new direction, even though it's the last page of the issue. And it really says, you know what? Yeah, we can have fun with character design, with the interaction, but you know what? This is still, this can be a really deadly serious book. And nobody's fucking around at this point in time. And this is really going to set the stage for what's going to be coming next, which is going to be, uh, it's going to be Fraction and Francesco Francavilla on the next two issues. And I cannot fucking wait for that. But losing Aja for a couple of issues, I can certainly stand, especially if it's going to be someone like Francavilla coming in but, I mean, David Aja, he's just put such a unique artistic signature on this book, and that is definitely one of the high points. Because, I mean, you have Fraction, you have Aja. Fraction plus Aja equals, generally, awesome. I just actually, over the weekend, treated myself to one of the... Uh, oh, I can't reach it! Um, one of the trades, uh, one of the... Uh, whatever they call this, the premier format trades of uh, Mortal Iron Fist with uh, Brubaker and Fraction Aja. This is the second arc, the Seven Capital Cities of Heaven. Um, and I got it used. Um, because I have the world's fucking coolest record store about three blocks away from my house and they sell everything. They sell used DVDs, used records, use vinyl, thank God for vinyl, and they also are selling used books and used graphic novels, in which I picked up a whole bunch of stuff, including a book, Spider-Man Dr. Octopus, uh, Negative Exposure, written by Brian K. Vaughn. So, uh, which was something I, I've never read before. I did hear of it, but I had no idea that Vaughn wrote it. So that's going into my reading pile tonight, I think, as soon as I'm done here. But anyway. But you have, you know, Aja just so creative with the art, with just the kind of, like, the mod style that he's going for here. You know, every character has their own character very specific kind of color scheme and everything like that. You know, you have, uh, uh, you know, you have, uh, you know, Natasha in her, you know, non-costume, uh, but it still reflects her costume motif. You know, it's black. She's got kind of the, the gold belt. Um, and then, of course, you know, you have Kate in the, in the, in the purple. And then you have... Uh, Bobby, who's kind of in the, uh, you know, kind of the, the lightish shades of her own costume, you know, with the white kind of stripe down the center, and again, kind of this, uh, you know, kind of dark purple, uh, you know, outfit. And then you have Jessica, who has, you know, kind of, again, kind of the Spider-Woman color motif on her dress. 
and just the art, gorgeous. And basically, it's, what I wrote down here is like, you know, like I said, it's Fraction plus Aja equals awesome. Clint plus Kate minus Bobby plus Natasha minus Jessica equals so goddamn awesome. And that's basically what this book is. It is so goddamn awesome. And it's an absolute 5 out of 5. I mean, Fraction just continuing to slay with this book. So Hawkeye, number 9, 5 out of 5. And that is it for tonight. I, I know that uh, this probably ran longer than I expected it to for just doing Marvel books. So, and tomorrow I've got... Although there were a lot of Marvel issues that came out this week, there were only four DC pickups that I made this week, but I'm going to want to talk about pretty much all of them and in, in detail. And then tomorrow night with the Independence, there is definitely one or two that are going to be deserving of a lot of attention, a lot of focus. So that might be as long as this one, if not maybe a little bit longer. So like I said... This is going to be an epic week. I don't know if you guys are going to want to set a playlist for this or what, but uh, just still watch them and you know, as they come out and have a good time with them, okay? So that is it for this evening's New Comics, bitches! I know that this eventually kind of got me out of the funk that I was in as, uh, earlier on, and which is why I still wanted to do this tonight, so I'm glad that I did it um, because, you know, it's just, you know, to me, you know, if you, you know, if sometimes if it's a little bit too, if reality is just a little bit too fucked up, read a comic book. Doesn't cost much, and it will take you away from all the bullshit and all the horror for at least a little while. So, if you take away, if you take anything away from tonight's edition, please take that away. Don't let the horrors of the world completely envelop you. Because if you do, there's just no coming back. So, again, that is it for this evening's New Comics Bitches. So, thank you so much for watching. If you're listening on iTunes, thank you again for listening. And I'm going to leave you now. So, don't forget to tune in tomorrow night for when I'll be talking about the independence. And so, this is James Donnelly. Thanking you once again for listening and or watching the Shadow Gallery for this week, and for tonight anyway. And just, of course, a quick reminder to always stay in the shadows.